Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. It's good to see you made it back to another episode. As I said in a recent video, a lot of you guys have been requesting longer videos of compilations of my favorite stories. So, this is going to be one of those videos. I know you guys love the deep woods just as much as I do. So I decided to compile a bunch of my favorite ones I've read recently. Sit back, relax, and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you're new and that like button to support the channel. And get ready for some scary and allegedly true deep wood stories that'll keep you out of the woods anytime soon. I grew up in a small southern town. When I was a kid back in the 70s and 80s, it was normal to ride our bikes everywhere, wade in nearby creeks and play deep in the woods. Where we lived there were hundreds of acres of woods. There were several spots we could pretty much just enjoy playing where odd-shaped trees grew, grapevines hung over bank edges, or where clearings gave way to the joys of sunshine and wind. One of our favorite spots was relatively small with several crooked trees we could bounce on. It is hard to describe if you are not familiar with the wooded areas around here. This area is like an exceedingly small valley. It gets extremely hot in the south, so a valley with towering trees also gave us some good shelter from the hot summer sun. My sister and I had been playing for quite a while, and were getting pretty hungry. She went to the house, which was not very far away, to make some sandwiches for us. I watched as she walked off. As I stood thinking about clearing away some unwanted branches, I got this very odd feeling. I noticed it had gotten incredibly quiet, which sent a chill down my spine. Then, I saw something. I saw a shadow of someone or something that was standing on top of the hill behind me. At first, I thought it could be the owner of the property who was kind of an elderly gentleman. He was normally nice, but he was not this tall nor this slim, and he would have spoken to me, I'm sure of it. Now. As a 10-year-old, I had learned that if I closed my eyes upon seeing a scary thing, it would be gone when I opened them. Maybe this sounds odd, but when I did this, either what I saw became explainable or simply would be gone and filed away as a figment of my large imagination. I closed and opened my eyes. The shadow remained. My heart was racing. I was frozen. Again, I closed and opened my eyes. The shadow remained. I noticed it moved its arm slightly. I continued to close and open my eyes, but this shadow was very real. I felt its stare. I have no doubt that it was watching me intently. After what seemed like forever, I heard my sister walking back. I watched her as she made her way back with the sandwiches in hand. She was talking, but when she saw me, she stopped and asked what was wrong. I looked down again at the shadow but it was gone. I was no longer frozen in fear and told her we needed to go home. I started running. My sister was so afraid she dropped our sandwiches as we got to our yard. I told her what I had just seen. Even as a 10 year old, I was very practical and very skeptical. I decided to go back the next day at the same time and study shadows from that hill. My sister came with me, though she was afraid. I had her stand on the hill and stood where I had stood the day before, but my sister's shadow was normal. I tried several things, but I could not explain away the shadow I had seen. It was very tall. I estimated the height of the creature to have been at least seven feet tall. I have seen a lot of strange things in my life. I can find logical explanations for most of them, but I know the shadow I saw in the forest that day was real, and it was not a human. I never saw it again, but I will never forget it. Hello, my name is Mason, and I have a story to tell you. I'm sorry if my English isn't that great. It is not my native language. Now, let us get in with the story. When I was 13 years old, my parents had a divorce, and I had a pretty hard time and so did my brother Jack. So my mom thought it would be a good idea for a move, you know, have a new start. We moved into a new house, not far away from where we had lived before. 
The house was nice, and we also had a forest nearby. During the first three days, we unpacked our stuff. My brother and I loved to explore the woods behind our house. At daylight, it was just beautiful, walking around and listening to the birds singing. One day, my mother had a meeting in another city, and in the evening she left. She would not be back for around three days or so. My brother, who was five years older than me, was supposed to look after me. But around 9pm, Jack got a call from one of his friends and wanted to go out. He did not call my mom because he knew that she would say no. So he told me to stay in the house and that he will be back at midnight. So he left and at first everything was cool. Sitting home alone watching TV shows and I was eating whatever snacks that I wanted. Then I got bored and I got the great idea to go explore the dark woods. I was sure it would be exciting being on my own in the woods at night. So I took my flashlight and went out. Of course, I locked the door behind me. It was a warm night. I went to the trees and followed a path. At first, it was pretty nice, hearing the owls and the animal noises, until I heard a typical horror movie stick break. It was right next to me, and suddenly, all the noises in the woods died. It was complete silence. My heart was pounding. I turned my head and saw a dark figure crouching with its back facing towards me. I thought my mind was playing tricks on me at first, but then the figure stood up. It had to be the same height as me. And as it came closer, I honestly began to swallow my tears and bravely asked, Who, who are you? The figure giggled. I shined my flashlight at it and my stomach dropped. I stood face to face with myself. He or I had a wide grin on his face and giggled. It looked exactly like me, but one thing excluding that I stood in front of my twin bothered me more. The other me had its eyes wide open, like his grin, and then he reached out for me. The hands were it. The fingers were thin as if they were like pencils, and there was blood all over them. I nearly fainted from fear. Then I snapped out of my paralysis and dropped everything I had carried with me. I ran for my life. I heard the thing behind me, laughing and running hysterically. I got to the tree line and sprinted towards the house. Luckily, I kept the keys in my trousers. I rushed inside and locked the door. I was crying now and sat behind the door, freaking out. A couple of minutes later, somebody knocked at the door. I screamed and backed up from the door. The door flung open and I screamed, Get out! I closed my eyes, cried, screamed when somebody touched me. I hit whoever it was. The person gave me a hard slap to the face. What's wrong with you? I opened my eyes. My brother was completely shocked. He stood in front of me. Behind him was one of his buddies. I could not stop crying and sniffed. I then reached for my inhaler. My brother helped me onto the couch. I was shaking and hyperventilating. Then one of his friends, I believe his name is Cole, asked, Dude, what happened to you? I now saw that my legs were covered in blood. I began to speak with a shaky voice when I finished the story. My brother was angry. At first he said, I'm going to beat that asshole up. But then I got to the part with the hands. They all went silent. The blood on my legs was not mine, by the way. I still have no ideas who it was. I am shaking right now. Remembering this story has kept me up for nights and nights on end. Neither I nor my brother ever wanted to tell my mom what happened that night. But two months after the incident, they found a body in the woods. It was a little boy. I freaked out and told the police everything, but of course they did not believe me. We moved shortly after that. I am very thankful for this. Thanks for listening to my story. It helped to write that down, and it feels good to share it with other people. Hey Swamp Folk, sorry to interrupt these stories, but today's episode has been sponsored by HelloFresh. What is HelloFresh, you ask? Well, with HelloFresh, you get fresh pre-measured ingredients, and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. 
You can skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips, so you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in just about 30 minutes or less. You can try HelloFresh's quick and easy meals, 15 to 20 minute dinners, breakfast on the go, and more easy options, perfect for your busy lifestyle. Honestly, I've been using HelloFresh for nearly two years now, and I absolutely love this service. It has expanded my palate, and I can try new meals from all over the world at any time. So, if HelloFresh sounds like something that could help your life, be sure to go to HelloFresh.com slash Swamped14 and use code Swamped14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Swamped14 and use code Swamped14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. Come find out why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Now, let's get back to the stories. To give a little bit of context, I'm a 28-year-old man. I'm 6'1", 260 pounds, born and raised in the middle of the Corn Belt in Illinois. At the time of this incident, I was 22 or 23 years old. I had been a fisherman and hunter since I was a child, and my dad and I always hunt family land. We were out one day during muzzleloader season, basically modern-day muskets for those who do not know, I am sitting in my tree stand when I look to my left and see a strange yellow light coming from the timber. It was coming from the direction my dad was in, so I take a picture of it with my phone and send it to my dad asking if that was him. Right at the same time, he was doing the same thing to me. We get to texting about it more, and I notice there is a second light about an hour later. We arrange a spot to meet when darkness falls. We meet there. We pull our flashlights out and look in the direction the light was coming from, and there is a path of tiki torches in the middle of the woods. We ended up calling the sheriff's station to have them come look. They followed the path up to a clearing in the middle of a thick part of the trees, and there are more and more tiki torches arranged in a pentagram. In the middle of that pentagram was a jawbone and six wild berries. This was made even weirder by the fact that I was out on that same piece of property a week earlier with my uncle, and we had both heard a gunshot from that same spot. Neither of us or the sheriff's department found anything else. But I still feel like I'm in a horror movie every time I get caught in the back of that piece of forest alone in the dark. Just as a side note, where we found the pentagram was only 20 yards from where I was sitting. I used to live in northern Washington state, having moved there from the Midwest for work. The town I lived in was big enough as it had a university and was close to the Canadian border, but not very populated and mostly rural, forested, and mountainous. Like the Midwest where I am from, there is a good amount of wildlife there. I would see bald eagles, owls, hawks, raccoons, deer, and I would see cougar prints on hiking trails. Thankfully, I never crossed a cougar's path that I know of. In the Midwest, I have seen plenty of deer. I cannot throw a stick without hitting one. Black bear on several occasions, and even been terrifyingly close to a moose once on accident. I am telling you all this so you know that I am 100% sure what my brain told me at first was a deer was not a deer. On the night I saw it, several years ago, I was heading back to work at around 11 p.m. I had been working the overnight shift for several weeks at this point, so was pretty used to the weird time of being at work. I was not especially tired and had already been awake for more than an hour, getting ready and had a cup of coffee in me. My commute consisted mostly of driving through flat land, since it is near the coast, with lots of trees broken up by some small fields. The road is lit with street lamps but not enough to always be well lit the entire drive. I was coming around an unlit bend with a field on my right and a thick, treed median on my left. I saw a deer walking away from the road in the field, 
so I immediately let my foot off the gas and looked for more that might be coming out of the trees. Rarely did I ever see a lone deer. Always at least two or more, sometimes as many as ten crossing together. The deer was far enough ahead still walking that I looked back at it again as I passed by. As I passed it though, I realized that it was not a deer at all. It was just very wrong. I really do not know how else to describe it. It had stopped in the field, and it just was not a deer anymore, or anything like a deer. I think it was bigger than a deer at the very least, and I felt like it was observing me as I passed by it. I had that sinking feeling in my gut you get when something dreadful was about to happen, but I went past it, stepped on the gas, and got back to above the speed limit while gripping the steering wheel with all I had. Nothing dreadful happened, luckily, and I got to work just fine. I have moved to a different state now, but I used to always look out for that not deer thing whenever I drove by late at night. I have no clue what I would do if I saw it again. It was not the only weird thing that happened to me there, but it is the one I think the most about. I'm not sure where to share this, but I've been freaking out for a few days now. I would love any advice anyone may have. I want to start by saying that everything that I'm about to talk about is absolutely true, and if you don't believe me, that's completely fine. I live in a woodsy area in the northwest of Ohio. My house is about a half a mile in the woods, down a long driveway, and my property is surrounded by trees from each side except for the back, which has a field that alternates soybeans and corn every year. We're just a few minutes away from a very small village and about a half an hour away from bigger towns. I just wanted to give some background into the area before I say what happened, in case that helps at all. I've had some weird stuff happen before. I've encountered what I think are not deers. Once, there was one in my yard walking around apple trees which isn't uncommon, but the thing was huge and absolutely ugly, and it just looked all wrong. There was also one next to a country road I was driving down with my friend once. A few years ago, I was dog-sitting for some friends. I never had a dog at this point, but I did have some experience watching them. So I was out walking this dog near the field, and he turned around as there was a huge splash in our pond, he started growling and eventually howling. Other than that, the dog was really friendly and I'd never heard him even growl before. I joked saying it was a frogman, like the Loveland frogman, but I ignored it for the most part. Last year, my family got a dog of our own and he's a hound dog, so he chases and barks at pretty much everything. But sometimes, he gets weird about the pond too and he'll growl and howl at it. He doesn't really growl other than that and I have no further explanation on what is happening over there. But the incident that I came here to share about happened only a few days ago. This year is a corn year in the field behind our house, which I always hate because I can't see past the first couple of rows, and I've always thought that it's pretty creepy. Before crops are planted, I like to rock hunt and metal detect in the field, surrounding the couple of woods scattered throughout the fields. There's a big creek that runs through it too. I mainly stick to the field directly behind my house because I don't have to wander out too far. The farthest out I've ever really gone is probably about a mile. A couple of days ago, I was out with my dog, walking along the line of dirt between the trees in the back of my property in the field, when my dog started growling at the corn. It obviously scared the hell out of me, and I was yelling at him to stop. When I was little, we would get coyotes around there all the time so I figured it was more than likely a coyote. Since I didn't want myself or my dog to get hurt by the coyote, I started walking back to the house, but my dog just was not having it. He was pulling on the leash and baying and howling and losing his mind. He doesn't usually bay, and he doesn't howl unless there's a squirrel that's treed or something. So the fact that he was just screaming into the cornfield really freaked me out. We started walking again, and then... I heard what sounded like a meow come from the corn. 
I was like, okay, it's just a cat. Cool. But I have a cat, and there's plenty of barn cats that cross our property, and my dog has never once lost his mind over a cat like that before. So I keep tugging on his leash, and I'm like, dude, let's go. You're freaking me out. The cat keeps meowing, and it's getting very uncomfortably loud for a cat. It sounded like it was a lot closer than it actually was. And then this cat thing started growling, but it sounded more like a big dog, like these were massive growls. Then the corn started rustling, bigger than what a cat would ever be able to do. Luckily at that point, I was just about to my backyard, and the growling kind of developed into what sounded like a yell or a scream from a human being. I was dragging my dog at this point. My dog was growling, his hair on his back sticking up. I was scared and shaking. I was absolutely terrified. I went back to my house and told my family what happened, and they were just like, okay, cool, whatever. But I was nearly in tears. It was scary. Again, I don't know if this is the right show to share this on, or if anybody will find this scary, but to me, in that moment, I was absolutely terrified. Nothing like this has ever happened since. Not that I want it to, but if anybody has any explanations or advice, please let me know in the comments down below. Hi Swamp Dweller. Before I start this story off, I just wanted to say I love and admire your work. It must be tough to narrate and edit so many stories. Anyways, let's jump right into this. Before I start, I just want to say I have never experienced anything paranormal, so to speak, except for a very few strange but very mild happenings. I have always struggled with insomnia, vivid detailed nightmares, and anxiety, so it was no surprise to me when I woke up to another terrifying dream. Warning you, this may sound ridiculous, but again, all my dreams are very vivid and have detailed plot lines and dialogue. Some from when I was very young, I still remember to this day. In this dream, my brother and I were walking along a very familiar path in a national park next to my house. For context, I live in Australia. We take walks in it almost every single day. Our home, our mother, came crashing in and told us we were in grave danger going to be punished for stealing something that belonged to someone else. Again, I know it's ridiculous, but just bear with me here. Afterward, I took a solo walk along that same path and saw what looked to be a brown-haired girl in long, white, mud-stained dress suddenly appeared in front of me, blocking the path. She had no distinct features I can remember, except for a very angry, judgmental expression. As usual, I woke up with a start at around 6 a.m., it recounted the dream in my journal. That night, as per routine, I took my dog out on a walk at around 6.30 p.m. Around my neighborhood, stopping at the gate at the very same path from my dream. Again, like I said, we live very close to this national park. Even when I was nearing it, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up and my whole body felt tense. But now, I was shaking and had this unshakable feeling that I shouldn't be here. Not to mention my dog who is usually calm and stoic and very collected, was whining and pulling back on her lead. How stupid and irrational, I thought. How many times had I taken this path? Had we taken it as a family, and I hadn't given it a second thought. But now every sense was telling me to run as far as my legs would carry me. Now I know this is cliche and very foolish, but I ignored this feeling, all of them. I pulled my dog forward, though it took some effort, through the gate and started walking. Immediately, another family rounded the corner and started walking toward us. They stared, fixated as we passed each other. My dog was growling, but I didn't think too much of it. We continued along the path, and by this time, this foreboding feeling had faded just a little bit. As we passed a meadow and into the trees, the strangest thing that's possibly ever happened to me occurred. It was like both the clouds and trees parted, revealing a massive ray of sunlight streaming down onto the path and all around us, illuminating everything in my sight. Now, this may not seem too strange, but remember, this is around 7 p.m. in July in Australia. The sun had gone down well around a half an hour ago, 
not to mention the sense of peace and reassurance I got when it all happened, like everything was going to be alright. I can't tell you more about this experience, because there's nothing really more to tell, except for the fact that I cannot get it out of my head. The next few stories are very brief. Throughout my life, I have had many times where I have recognized something that happened during my day as something identical to a dream. This can range from reading something in a newspaper, an, an article, or, or even to meeting someone new, or even as simple as walking down an unfamiliar street. One time was extremely creepy, and it left me scared. I was at my grandmother's house playing some board game one night when I got that overwhelming and overpowering feeling that I have been here before. It was triggered by something she had said. But how could this possibly be? She hadn't said anything remotely profound, and I had never played this game before. In fact, she had just bought it that day. It might not sound like anything creepy, but for some reason, that horrible and foreboding feeling I felt in that National Park Trail came back. I haven't gone back in weeks, and I kind of feel sort of bad for my grandma. If this makes it into a video, I hope whoever is listening to this enjoyed these stories and can help provide a logical explanation that would be helpful. This is an account of my experience last week while camping. I would leave my location out for privacy reasons. Last week I decided to go camping at a nearby national park. I'm an experienced camper and I have camped this spot dozens of times. I parked in the designated parking spot for campers and grabbed my gear. I headed off into the wilderness. I normally like to get away from people. I can cover 20 miles in a day, but I don't normally do that every time. I had been walking for about 5 hours, so it was a 5 hour hike from my car. I knew I was far from the normal tourist and family gatherings. That was my intention. It was close to sundown, and everything started to get dark. Walking along the trail in the forest, it gets pitch black very fast. I had not seen another person for quite a few hours. I had a pretty good idea that I was alone, and the chances of coming across another person was very small as late as it was and as far off as I was. I was walking to where I was going to set up my tent for the night, and I could only see roughly about 10 feet in front of me, and it was getting darker by the minute. Eventually, it would be pitch black, and there would be no lights out here. Normally, the only light is from your fire or flashlight or cell phone. As I was walking, I heard what sounded like footsteps coming just behind my available light, off in the trees about 40 yards away. I stopped to listen and tried to figure out exactly what it was. I stood there, scanning the distance, but the noise had stopped. I then spotted what looked like a dark figure standing behind or next to a tree. I couldn't tell which. Whatever it was, it was just standing there. I couldn't make out the shape very well, so I thought it was a deer. I stood there quietly looking at it. I must admit I was pretty scared. Being alone and so far from any help, I was definitely more than a little spooked. I've heard stories of murderers who attack unsuspecting campers or hikers in some national parks because of how vast the area is and how vulnerable the people are being away from civilians. I stood there for a few minutes, scared that it was going to start coming towards me. I was not sure what it was. I didn't know if it was a wild animal. I mean, yo, know, those can attack people too. I decided to turn around keeping my eyes on the mysterious dark figure. I was scared that it was going to follow me. I knew I couldn't walk all night five hours back to my car in the dark. I was tired and didn't want to make any light. My plan was to stay quiet and lay on the ground until dawn. I would sleep if everything was kosher. I walked about a football field away until I could not see it anymore and unrolled my sleeping bag. I laid there looking in the direction and listening. About 45 minutes went by and I heard footsteps in the distance. My heart began racing because I could not see anything at this point. I didn't know if it was an animal. Whatever it was would take a few steps and stop. Take a few steps and stop. Over and over. I couldn't see, but from the direction of the noise, whatever it was walked by my side, about 15 yards away, then crossed in front of me. Then, it stopped. It was very close. My heart was beating so fast I swear it was going to burst. I was sure it could hear me breathe. 
It kept going as it crossed in front of me and walked further away. Whatever it was had come very close to me. I laid there, too scared to move. I couldn't hear anything. For all I knew, it was standing still right by me. I heard no noises, no human sounds or animals, only the sound of leaves and sticks being walked on. From that time, it crossed in front of me and headed off away from me, and the time I couldn't hear anything. I managed to get my nerves enough to get up and walk back to my car. I did not hear or see anything since hearing it come that close to me as it crossed my path and headed off in the other direction. I made it to my car and where the other cars were. The sun was close to coming and I fell asleep in my car eventually. I could hear people talking and kids laughing as I slept, so I felt safe. I know, not any blood and guts, but this was still a very creepy story. I don't know what it was, I don't know how to explain it. It could have been an animal. I'm just glad that it didn't find me and do something terrible to me. If anybody in the comments down below has any idea what this could have been, please let me know. This happened a few years ago in a campground in Florida. I visit this campground every two years, and I was very familiar with it at this point. It's right next to my favorite national park. This is the first time anything like this has ever happened to me, though. This campground is inside the national park, like I said, so there's a thick forest surrounding it. My cousin and I left the cabin and went on a walk down the road and through the woods at sunset. Roughly a mile or so in, we go off the road and into an area that I'm not very familiar with. It was a roundabout type road with trimmed weeds in the middle. The roundabout has two roads to it. The one we entered from and another one that leads to an area I'm not very familiar with. To the left of the roundabout was a large cabin my family frequently rented out for events. To the right was a picnic area, gazebo, and such that overlooked a pond. We were surrounded by dense, thick forest. My cousin and I go to the gazebo to talk and watch the gorgeous sunset over the pond. We found the fuse box for the gazebo and turned it on for a little extra light while we talked. After a while, darkness started to catch up with us, and we realized the area looked like a perfect spot for a horror film. So, we decided to turn off the light and head back to cabin. As I was in the center of a national park, there were no light poles or street lights. It was pitch black save for our phone flashlights. Once we turned off the gazebo, we noticed something that shouldn't be there. In the middle of the roundabout area was a green light and orb suspended about five feet in the air. It was about the size of a grapefruit, and it didn't move. There was nothing in the roundabout that could produce light, and the light didn't illuminate anything or look like it was attached to anything. My cousin and I were a little freaked out by this and make our way towards the road avoiding the orb as much as we can. A short way down the road we realized we had no idea where we were, and that we went down the wrong road. We return to the roundabout area and the orb is still there. Unfortunately, the road we needed to get to was on the other side, meaning we would have to pass this light about six feet away to get to it. We tried our best to walk by, and with a closer look, I still could not see the source of this light. We eventually returned to the cabin, and all was good again. That was my first and only time being in that area at night. I didn't take photos because I feared being in pitch black woods in the middle of the night and I was too busy using my phone's flashlight to make sure I didn't accidentally step on a snake. That night, I googled for any paranormal activity in that campground and that national park and only came up with random articles saying the devil appears in insert campground name here type of stories. Nothing really explains the orb though. I asked my friend about it and he said it was probably an animal spirit, but it was very motionless. It was just suspended in the air, just glowing bright green. This has left me feeling extremely shaken, and I'd love some opinions, especially from someone with experience. Last year, I had a very strange experience in a national forest out in California. I was by myself on a road trip with my dog, and I was driving far into the Mendocino National Forest. I like to camp in national parks and forests because it's isolated, 
so my dog can roam, and they are free of charge. A trade-off for the sketchy, rough drive into the park sometimes, and the lack of service and assistance. Anyway, I was driving up this dirt road kind of curling up a mountain. It was roughly around 5pm if I had to guess. It was very nice out, sunny, and warm with a slight breeze. Nothing serious happened, but I felt extremely uncomfortable driving into the area, and that feeling did not let up. Driving up the mountain, I felt like I shouldn't stay there, and I even texted my boyfriend about it for as long as I could before my phone completely lost service. I was looking for a sign of another person having been around the area lately, but didn't see anything. I pulled over and got out of my car, and with my dog, to go look over to the edge and noticed a dead squirrel and some broken glass mixed in with the dirt and gravel road. Yucca, my dog, starts to growl slightly. She is vocal, but I've almost never heard her growl. I did see her growl at a possum once, I guess, so it could be something she smelled. This place continued to make me feel quite on edge, but I pride myself in being an independent traveler and backpacker, so I decided to continue at least a bit further with my grumbling pup to see if I could find a good place to camp. I continued to notice more animals. Dead animals. Keep in mind, no one is going to be going more than 5 to 10 miles per hour up this road, and that's if there's anyone even here. Suddenly, I hear men's voices. They sound close, and I think I should call out to them. So I stop my car, but I kind of freeze up and feel like I should not. I really cannot for the life of me make out what they were saying. I do not see any sign of people anywhere, and I get back in my car and continue to slowly drive forward and cautiously look for where the voices could be coming from. I've never run into other people in a national park or forest when I've gone this deep in. The unsettling feeling grows in the voices, which have sort of come and gone a few times, and I give up and begin to turn my car around. Honestly, I do not remember how Yucca was acting on the way down. I was scared and focused on getting out of there safely. I just distinctly remember being surprised at her grumbling when we were standing outside of my car. Kind of dangerously quickly, I went back down the mountain not seeing any sign of anyone. I decided to spring for luxury and get a hotel for the night. I figured it was just fine. It was just a huge and open space and it can be intimidating, I told myself. The voices could have been echoing from somewhere far off and they just sounded close. Animals die, glass gets broken, nothing happens. Cool. But I remember this place. It sticks with me. Whenever I'm watching scary movies, if I'm walking my dog in the woods at night, nothing compares to the feeling I had driving up that mountain and that national park. It honestly kind of interests me sometimes, but it always has me frightened. I recently happened across some information as well as some Native American lore that made me feel extremely uneasy. Fast forward a year. I've mentioned this place to a few people and the haunting vibes it gave me, but nothing much more. I googled the National Park once or twice and didn't see much of anything that looked like it matched my story. I like scary movies and I like things of that nature, hence my fascination with this whole event. So my boyfriend and I were coming up on finishing our road trip just yesterday. We were in Wyoming for a wedding. There were only two to three hours left and the sun had set, so we decided to listen to some scary podcast and YouTube videos. We went from the No Sleep podcast to the X-Files and ended up on a Swamp Dweller video dealing with Native American lore. I'm half paying attention, petting my dog, playing Pokemon on the emulator. And I hear the narrator mention Wendigos. Very briefly, the narrator says what they are and casually mentions they can mimic voices. I mean... When I say the most horrible chills I had ever had in my life crawl down my spine, I stare at my boyfriend and ask him if he remembers that national forest I was freaked out about last year. He says he does, and he reminds me that he texted me I was probably close to a Wendigo. And he did do that. I remember him saying that, but didn't know much about their lore and thought he was just trying to scare me, you know, some funny Bigfoot stuff. He was like, no, I, I mean, I was mostly joking, but... I said it specifically because you said you were hearing voices that you couldn't find a trace of. I feel strange and I start googling Wendigos, etc. They are allegedly able to mimic human voices and they would live in that sort of area. It all matched up. Obviously, there's a ton of questionable info out there, but I tried to find more reputable websites and authentic experiences 
which is how I found this show. I then specifically looked up missing persons in the area, and the first headline that catches my eye is, Another family goes missing in Mendocino. And I thought that this was very reminiscent of what I went through. I went through different websites and news articles of people going missing, but they are all a little hidden underneath national park websites and pictures of trees. I remember looking up the forest about a year ago and didn't see anything, and realized these stories didn't seem to be talked about much, which also piqued my intuition. It was stated that well over 100 people in the past 8 years have gone missing, and had not been found on top of many who are found dead. It just was my intuition, super spiked, remembering how safe I, uh, I felt and how much I wanted to get out of there at any means necessary. It still terrifies me to this day to think about. And even though it was just a storytelling video, those stories originate from somewhere. I have done a lot of solo traveling both in and out of the country, and I have never had such a bad feeling. On top of seeing such an unnecessary number of dead animals in a national forest, just seems so strange. I live in a small city here in Arizona. About 40 miles or so to the north is the city of Phoenix, as well as the Tonto National Park. But to the south, it's pretty much all desert as far as the eye can see. A lot of the outdoorsy type people opt to go hiking in the mountains of Tonto, or along the Salt River near Roosevelt, but I much prefer the Sonora Desert. There's something peaceful about being out there. And nothing beats rambling through the mesas listening to Horse With No Name to relieve stress after a busy work week. But if there's one thing I've learned from hiking out there, it's to stick to the lowlands. Because there are people hiding among the bluffs out there that you really don't want to run into. And this is my own personal encounter with one of them that took place a few years ago. So a couple of years ago, I went hiking in the Tonto National Park. It's unusually hot for this late afternoon, and I'm starting to run out of water. I usually start heading back to my car when my canteen starts to run low. As you can imagine, it's not safe being out in the desert with no water. But I was in a real hiking mood. I had more than my usual amount of stress to burn off, and I honestly didn't really feel like turning around just yet. Then, right as I'm deciding whether to actually call it a day or not... I see something shining out from a hilltop not too far away. It looked like a little blinking light coming from the direct east. And it took me a moment to realize it was a lens flare from a pair of binoculars. I figured it was another hiker, maybe even a group of them, and that if I asked nicely, I might be able to bum a little water off them so I could continue my hike. So I pick up the pace, winding through the cacti in hopes that I could catch them on the hilltop. It's tough going, and I'm sweating like a turkey during holiday season, by the time I'm halfway up the hill. But I'm determined to reach the top before they depart, imagining that I might be able to make myself some new hiking buddies in the process. But when I finally reach the top, there's no one to be found. The place was completely deserted. I take a little look around, and I don't see anyone. Yet I do find evidence that someone had in fact been there at some point, and rather recently too. I see all these gear boxes covered in camouflage material, canvas bags shoved into cracks in the boulders, solar panels sitting out in the sun, and even a kitchen with a stove set up under a rock overhang where there was a fire still burning. It was a full-on campsite on the top of that hill, with a commanding view of the surrounding area. Only it was just a matter of minutes ago that I had seen the lens flare coming down from what I assumed was this exact site. It was about then that I got this eerie feeling that I was being watched from somewhere, and it didn't take long for me to discover how that feeling wasn't entirely without reason. Manos arriba, cabron, someone said from behind me in a gruff but chilling calm voice. Uh, I, I know enough Spanish to be able to recognize that this meant hands up, and punctuating those words was the unmistakable sound of someone locking and loading a gun of some description. Por favor, no disperse, I said, as I raised my trembling hands into the air. Please don't shoot me. The person then said something else in Spanish, something I didn't understand, but the fact that they then pushed me down onto my knees clued me in that it wasn't good. I thought that was it for me. 
We have no idea how easy it would have been for them to just shoot me, right then and there, before leaving my body out in the desert for the vultures and coyotes. Had they done so, there's a good chance no one would have ever found me. Not in one piece, anyway. But instead of just straight up executing me, this mysterious person began to pat me down for weapons. Then, when they were happy that I wasn't carrying any, they emptied my pockets of my wallet, phone, and car keys. Alicia, they asked suddenly. Their words were muffled, and I could tell without turning that there was something covering their face. No, no, no Policia, no Estoy Policia, I said insistently, realizing that my life was depending on them believing my response to their question. There was every chance they might just put a bullet in the back of my head. Better to be safe than sorry. But no bullet came. Instead, I heard them speaking in Spanish again. Something that was too fast for me to understand. I thought it was another question or statement directed at me until I heard someone's voice coming over a radio set. Someone this person was obviously communicating with. I strained my ears to try to pick up what they were saying, knowing that my safety probably depended on whatever reply they were giving, but again I could barely make out a word. It was a dumb thing to do, but out of my curiosity, it just got the better of me for a moment. I found myself turning slowly to try to get a better look at the guy behind me. I only caught a little glimpse of the guy before he aimed his weapon at me and barked something. I believe don't look at me was probably what he said, but I vividly remember what he was wearing. Besides the ski mask that I figured he was wearing, he basically had a full military garb on. Combat boots, khakis, a tactical vest, and he held spare magazines for his rifle. As well as what looked like smoke grenades. I had no idea what he was doing up there, being so well equipped, but whatever it was, he meant business. The next thing I know, he throws my wallet and water bottle and car keys down in front of me, then holds my driver's license up to my face. You talk, you die, he says in broken English, before ordering me to my feet and dismissing me with a curt, Vamos. I did as I was told, utterly terrified that this mysterious gunman now knew my name and my home address and would also be able to share such information with whoever his supervisors were. Naturally, I had absolutely no intention of reporting him to the police, and I never told a single soul about this story. Until now. And I only do so under relative anonymity. Because when I got home from that hike, I did a little research on who that guy could have been, and what I found out absolutely terrified me. One of the first things I read online was an NBC article from 2011, which detailed how the Sinaloa cartel was sending scouts up into the hills around the Sonora Desert and the surrounding national parks. They were trying to track movement and activities of law enforcement. The article said that these cartel surveillance teams will camp up in the hills for sometimes two whole months at a time, and there were thought to be up to two to three hundred operatives working out there at any given time. They are even equipped with highly sophisticated military gear like night vision goggles and radio encryption equipment. I realized it was one of these guys that I ran into on my hike, and that I had been extremely lucky to have gotten away. If that guy had even suspected I was a DEA agent or something, and not some dumb hiker who was walking somewhere he shouldn't have been, I'd have had my bones picked clean by desert scavengers before the weekend was out. I won't lie, I'm no tough guy, and the whole experience most certainly put me off hiking around the desert for a while as it was frankly one of the most terrifying experiences of my entire life. My first time back was a little nerve-wracking, and I couldn't help but keep my eyes off the hills, just looking for that telltale glare of the binoculars of someone watching me. Hey Swamp Folk, sorry to interrupt this video and I hope you are enjoying it. Today's video is sponsored by HelloFresh. What is HelloFresh you ask? Well, with HelloFresh you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. I've been using HelloFresh for about two years now, maybe even a little bit longer, and I absolutely love how convenient it has made making dinner and has helped me stay dedicated to my recent diets and meal tracking. Now we all know fall can be hectic, with holidays rolling in and all of that, 
but HelloFresh's recipes save you time that you would otherwise be spending on meal prepping, grocery shopping, and shopping. So you can focus on getting back into a new routine and spending quality time with the family. HelloFresh offers you the flexibility you need to easily customize your order on the app within minutes, easily change your delivery day, food preferences, and plan size, or skip a week whenever you need. Fall is for family time. Recipes like meatloaf a la mom and one pot broccoli mac and cheese make a weeknight meal go off without a hitch. So what are you waiting for? Join me and many others in the swamp. Go to hellofresh.com slash swamped14 and use code SWAMPED14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. Go to HelloFresh.com slash SWAMPED14 and use code SWAMPED14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. We used to live in a haunted house. A wildly haunted house. And haunted or cursed land whatever you want to call it. I had invited a friend of mine at the time named Sky. We would go into the woods behind our house, chill and do normal teenage girl stuff, talking about boys and our relationships. Well, we decided for some reason to get up and go deeper into the woods because we knew there was a house being built not far from us. After a while of walking to this new structure, we sat on an old dried up log. Around us, we were just completely alone and it was just woods. We had randomly gotten quiet, and the silence was broken by a faint chanting loud enough to hear, but too faint to understand the words. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I could feel goosebumps on my skin. I swear, we could have gotten whiplash at how fast we looked at each other. Oddly, we immediately thought of some demonic stuff along with the lines of satanic worship. We nodded at each other, and I knew we were thinking the exact same thing, the second we stood up and heard the chanting clearly, sticks broke and we heard the classic horror movie nursery rhyme, Ring Around the Roses, by little girls, just chanting. Without a second thought or stutter, we ran all the way to the road, freaked the heck out, and walked home from there. A few months would go by and nothing seemingly happened. And then, I thought it too soon. Covers started to be pulled off of me at night, and my door would creak shut on its own, but it was my brother who had the biggest scare. My brother was up one night, up by himself as she usually does, laying on the couch. He was watching some of the regular ghost adventures, funny enough, and he gets a weird feeling. He looks around, uneased to see nothing. He looked out at the board on our kitchen floor that covered up the hole where the floor caved in. We were going to fix it in the morning. He shook his head and just thought that he was hearing things. Having paused the TV, he resumed it again. In the corner of his eye, he sees the board in the kitchen fly up and drop. Freaked out, he runs to my room and wakes me up. I think he's joking because I didn't hear anything and went back to bed. After some time, he sits back on the couch and watches TV as if nothing happened. Well, now he has to use the bathroom, so he gets up and goes to the bathroom. As he walked into the bathroom, he heard rattling on the bathroom glass, and the window was open for some reason. He brushed it off and went back to his business. When he finished, he turned his head to see black claws opening the window. He freaked out, honestly. He had no idea what to think. He thought something was starting to crawl in. My brother screamed like a girl. He was only 14 years old at the time and woke my dad up. But when we looked out the window, it was shut and everything in the house was fine. My name is Justin. I'm 37, but my story happened when I was 25 years old and a graduate of Bible College. For a bit of context, I will tell you a little bit about the state of mind I was in. I was raised very religiously by Southern Pentecostal parents. So, when I graduated high school, Bible College seemed like a smart choice as religion was everything to me at that time. However, at Bible College, I was soon awakened to the new reality. Most of what I had been taught by pastors and ministers growing up was simply not true. So I spent four years at college unlearning my entire upbringing and stumbling into a whole new reality. After graduating college, I spent a lot of time soul-searching and being in the forest, 
as we are surrounded by beautiful nature here in East Tennessee. So I decided to take a day hike in the mountains and just be alone with my thoughts. There are lots of access points to the Appalachian Trail near me, here in Elizabethton, Tennessee. I took a light pack containing water and snacks up to the mountain and got on the Appalachian Trail before going up the beaten path. I went for a while and feeling a bit like a tourist, I decided to make my own path and go off trail. I just turned off the trail and went up the mountainside until I found an animal path. I walked and walked for nearly an hour when I looked uphill to see that I was near the ridgeline. Just as I started to feel like the king of the mountain, I noticed the ambient noise around me seemed to decrease in volume quickly, going silent in a couple of seconds. I thought that I was the reason for this, as people have rarely come in this location, so I just paused for a second to enjoy the serenity of God's creation. That is when I heard rapid footfalls coming towards me from over the ridge. I froze instantly and almost soiled my pants. As I was trying to wrap my mind around what this could have been, the steps stopped abruptly where they were immediately followed by what sounds like something forging through dead leaves on the ground. Maybe an animal digging, I thought. Then more steps, followed by more foraging sounds. It feels like it's much closer now, that little voice said in my head. I was less than 50 yards away from whatever this thing was when there were more running steps, then foraging sounds again. It's coming this way, my common sense screamed. So now I am terrified. As it had sounded like something moving with purpose, apparently towards me, as I weighed the choices of fighting or fleeing, I stood as still as I could and strained to listen. Silence. Then, a rock, well, more like a small boulder, sailed through the trees and landed about 25 yards away from me and bounced down the hill a little further. As I began to question whether this was a dream or some sort of hallucination, another large rock impacted, suddenly a little nearer to me. My mind raced as I struggled to think of what animal might throw large rocks at a potential threat, but when a third mini boulder landed even closer to me, I knew it was time to go. Flight it is, I decided, still facing the same direction. I quietly took several steps backward, Slowly and carefully, keeping an ear to the wind, I turned and power hiked myself all the way back to the trail, which gladly was straight downhill. It seems I still have much to learn about this world we live in. But for me, I believe wholeheartedly Sasquatch is in the Appalachians. It's a reality for me that I now have accepted, as there is nothing else that could have been there. There's nothing else that could have caused this experience. I know there are a lot of Bigfoot stories, but the collection of tales told is building a bigger picture of the beings in our forest trying to live in peace. After hearing so many other people's stories about similar occurrences around the Appalachian Trail on your channel, I am now certain I am not crazy nor afraid to share my story. Thank you for telling our story, Swamp Dweller. I am sure I speak for lots of people when I say it means a lot. I experienced this back when I was 14 years old. Now I am 23 years old. Back when I lived on the outskirts of a small town in Montana, behind my home there was a forest. Now I have never stepped a foot into these woods until that day. The only time I had even gotten close to that forest was when I was tasked with walking the family dog, Charlie. Now, Charlie was a pretty big dog. I had never seen him cower before. On one of our walks, I heard noises in the woods. It was the sound of a branch snapping. Occasionally, when I took walks with Charlie, I would keep hearing these noises. One important thing to mention, though, is that whenever I took Charlie out during the day, nothing would ever really happen. But during dusk and dawn or nighttime, I would always hear these noises. The day I decided to head into the woods was an extraordinary day because it was my 14th birthday. After everyone was in bed, I had snuck out with Charlie and we navigate our way through, or, well, try to. We ended up getting lost and came upon an abandoned shed in the middle of the woods. Then the last thing I expected happened. Charlie started whimpering. That was never a good sign. I had wondered if there was someone there, but I couldn't see anybody. I didn't think I would need any form of protection, 
so I didn't have any with me. And then I heard the sounds. The sounds of crunches and snaps. All of the wildlife went silent. I was terrified, so all I could do was run to the shed and hide. Something or someone got closer. I heard the leaves crunching. It was the only way I could tell how close it was getting. Then a loud bang resonated through the woods. It was walking on top of the roof. I couldn't stop shaking, but I'd like to think that Charlie could now tell how scared I was because he started licking me. Around five or ten minutes later, it hopped off the roof and I peeked out the nearest window. There was a human-like creature with grotesque long limbs, pale skin, just like the moon, jagged bones, and joints. It was extremely thin. Its spine was protruding underneath its skin. Instead of bumps on the spine, they were like tips of a knife. I felt sick to my stomach and almost hurled. I managed to see its face. It was roundish. Its eyes were beady. They looked black, but I'm not completely sure. They were glossy like the eyes of a doll. Lifeless. And soon it had started to walk away, but not without turning back to me and letting out a demonic roar, like the roar of a lion mixed with the call of a raven. I think it knew I was there. I don't know what prevented it from killing me, but whatever it was, I am forever grateful. Remember, if there are woods near you and you hear strange sounds, leave it alone. Never forget that there are things out there that won't be as merciful as it was to me. And if anyone knows what this is, please let me know in the comments. My story happened in the woods of western North Carolina. My mom, dad, my brother, and myself were visiting my grandmother for the weekend. I was 14 years old at the time. We arrived at my Nana's house, this is what I call my grandmother, before dark. It was a Friday evening. We went inside and greeted Nana. My brother wanted to go ride his dirt bike out on some of the trails in the woods behind Nana's house. So I decided to take a walk along one of the trails with him. My mom told my brother and myself not to go too far into the woods. It would be getting dark soon. We both said okay. My brother went on his way and I went on mine. I was walking and just exploring. I noticed it seemed to be already getting dark. I decided to head back to the house and I noticed the woods were now very quiet. My dad has always said when the woods are quiet, there's some type of predator in the area. I looked ahead of where I was getting ready to turn around to head back to the house. I saw a figure. It was against a tree. I could see movement. It was, I'm guessing, around ten yards ahead of me. It turned to look at me. It saw me. It looked like a dog, standing on its hind legs, standing around five foot five in height. It was black, jet black. This creature didn't have hair, but had black skin in which looked charred. The creature had long pointed ears that stood up on its head. It had a long mouth. I also saw bright, glowing yellow eyes. I knew this wasn't just a dog, but in fact something very evil. I was so scared that I was almost frozen. I heard a voice saying, run, 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 in my head. I finally realized it was myself saying this. I started running as fast as I could. I could hear something running behind me, but I never looked back. I was far too scared. I saw Nana's house ahead and I ran up to the back door. I started banging on it and screaming, let me in. My mom, dad, and Nana all came to the door. I almost knocked them all down trying to get in. I yelled at them to shut the door. My dad shut it and I told them what I saw. By this time, my brother was already back. He heard me screaming. My dad and brother took some flashlights and walked out into the trail. They could not see anything. When they got back, my dad says, I think what you saw was a black bear. I told him about the woods becoming silent this time. He said bears can cause silence in the woods. I told my dad it was definitely not a bear, but I don't think anyone believed me. I told a couple of friends when I got home and they did believe me though. This happened years ago, but I've never forgotten it and I don't think I ever will. In all the research I've done, the closest thing that it possibly could have been was a dog man. To give a little bit of context, 
I'm a 28 year old man. I'm six foot one, 260 pounds, born and raised in the middle of the Corn Belt of Illinois. At the time of this incident, I was 22 or 23 years old. I've been a fisherman and hunter since I was a kid, and my dad and I always hunt on family land. We were out one day during muzzleloader season, basically a modern day musket for those who do not know. I'm sitting in my tree stand when I look to my left and see a strange yellow light coming from the timber. It was coming from the direction my dad was in, so I take a picture of it on my phone and send it to my dad asking if it was him. Right at the same time, he was doing the same thing with me. We get texting about it more, and I notice there's a second light about an hour later. We arrange a spot to meet when darkness falls, and we meet there. We pull our flashlights out and look in the direction the light was coming from. There is a path of tiki torches in the middle of the woods. We ended up calling the sheriff's station to have them come and take a look. We follow the path up to a clearing in the middle of a thick part of the trees, and there are more tiki torches arranged in a pentagram-type shape. In the middle of that pentagram was a jawbone of a human being and six wild berries. This was made even weirder by the fact that it was out on the same piece of property that we always hunt on, and a week earlier, my uncle was out there, and they had heard a gunshot from this general area. Now, the sheriff's department didn't really find anything else, but I still feel like I'm in a horror movie every time I get caught in the back of that piece of the forest alone in the dark. Just as a side note, where we found the pentagram was only 20 yards from where I was sitting. This is very strange, and I'll let you guys know if any more activity pops up. Me and my friend, whose alias is Elizabeth, always go on evening walks when I am sleeping over at her or her sister's house. Our usual route is going through the woods by a friend's house to the store and going back through the woods, and going to a weird thing where you can see the sea in the view. This is in February, in Finland, which means that it was pitch dark at about 8 to 9 a.m. We were on our way back, about halfway to view this thing, and we heard a sound that sounded like a flute, but at the same time, didn't. Basically, a harmonic, unnatural sound. We looked back and saw nothing. She asked me if I heard it. I said, yeah, do you still want to go to Coco Stenin? I asked, and she nodded. We walked about a meter or so, and we heard it again, but it was distant this time. At that moment, I started to pay more attention because the first time we heard it, it sounded like it was on our right in the woods, and the second time it sounded like it was 20 meters away, on the sand path we were walking on. When we arrived to the view thing, we walked seven steps up to the first level, and I heard a crack in the trees, and on the way there we heard the sound from all different directions, and varying directions and distances. We walked up the first narrow flight of stairs to the second level, which was smaller than the first, and we walked up the last flight of stairs to get to the top level, which is a square, about the size of 3 meters times 3 meters. I sat on the bench, overviewing the rest of the forest and the sea. My back turned from where we came from, and Elizabeth sat on the side where her back was turned to the path, and that's when it hit me. We were hearing the sound, but didn't hear any type of footsteps. It was dark out when we went, so the sky was dusted with stars. She looked at me. What? Don't like, I don't like that you're looking at me like that. You're kind of scaring me. What is it? I looked up and heard the sound again, but it sounded like it was under us now. Um, can we go, like, now? I walked before her because I'm stronger than her and can somewhat fight. When we were down from the view thing, we sped walked, and then boom, we heard the sound deep in the trees on our left, and not even two minutes later, we heard it right behind us. She started walking faster and I looked back. There was no one there. Let's run until we're at the pavement, I said, and she agreed. When we were finally on the pavement, we crossed the street twice so that we were on the road leading home. When we heard that sound from down the hill, which is impossible, I asked her if we could run 15 meters and then walk. We did that, and didn't hear a sound after that. We thought it was over. But, no. 
when we were about to cross the street to get to her house, we heard it again. It was directly behind us, or at least I did. She claimed that she didn't hear it that time. She was fumbling with her keys to try to get down. We ran down the seven steps and opened the door. I tried pulling the door closed, but it felt like someone was pulling it open. When the door finally shut closed, we ran up the two flights of stairs as fast as we could while being quiet and opened her apartment door and quickly went to her and her sister's room. When we got there, her sister asked why we were so shocked and spooked. We told her and their mother. She said it was probably a fox. And over the course of the night, I kept hearing footsteps in the staircase of the apartment building. The footsteps would occasionally stop at the front door, and I would hear taps on the door, and then it went down again. This repeated the entire night. The neighbors are all old, so they were all asleep, and who would do that all night? The next morning, we searched up what a fox sounded like, and it definitely was not a fox. This story comes from Labrador on the eastern coast of Canada. Before the iron ore mines and hydro dams took over in the 1960s, the fishing and fur industry was the main source of income. Young men on the coast would leave their homes in the fall, paddle up the Churchill River in a canoe, and spend the winter trapping furs and living in small log cabins called tilts. In early spring, as the season was winding down, one such trapper was finishing up his evening meal. He lit his pipe and was just sitting down to a cup of tea when he heard a voice coming seemingly from nowhere. In a hushed but clear tone, the voice told him to pack up all of his belongings and leave the cabin as soon as possible. At first, he doubted his ears, passing it off to the many weeks of isolation. Shortly after he finished up, he stepped outside to take in the evening air, but was again met with the same phantom voice telling him to pack his gear and leave. He was now certain he was not hearing things, and strangely, the voice sounded incredibly familiar to him, like it was someone he had known his entire life. He laid down on his caribou skin blanket for the night. He decided that if he heard the voice for a third time, he would listen to it and leave. Sure enough, not long after he bedded down, the voice now clear as a woman's voice pleaded with him to pack up and leave. He immediately sat up and began to gather his belongings, and well before the sun was up, he was heading back to civilization with his furs and gear in tow. It wasn't until he got back to town that he learned from another trapper how a day or two after he left, the ice on his part of the river broke up early and flooded the area, making travel impossible. If he stayed in the cabin, he would have been stranded for nearly a month, with his supplies mostly gone from the winter in the woods there was a very real chance that he would have starved. When the trapper was an old man, he revealed that when he left the tilt that night, he was hit with the realization that the voice he heard was that of his mother, who died when he was younger, and he credited her spirit for watching over her son and quite possibly saving his life. About five years ago, I and my sister went to a nature park, wetland so to speak. Of course, we went at night so we could skateboard around because you were not allowed to. But you know, I was a 14 year old trying to look cool in front of my 24 year old sister. Well, we went around the time the sun was setting. For a little bit more context, we got lost in the park because it was very big with condensed and thick woods. We were trying to find the bridge, a 20 foot or so bridge so we could hang out just above the rushing river. By the time we got there, the sun was hardly visible over the mountains. I was just looking around after drinking my water, and here's where all the creepy stuff begins. As I looked to the other side of the bridge, I saw a tall skinny figure. I first shrugged it off like it was a person, maybe a park ranger of the park, but then it got on all fours and ran away very quickly. At first, I really didn't see anything, mainly because I thought it could be a bear or something else entirely. 
I looked back at my sister as we chatted about boys and many other things. Then I looked back at the end of the bridge. My sister did too, and we both saw the same figure this time. At this point, I was incredibly freaked out. Mind you, it's not quite dark outside yet. The sky was purple and orange, so it wasn't like we were seeing things, like when your mind pictures figures in the dark. No, it was right there and getting closer and closer. I told my sister to get the hell out of there. Her going first off the bridge and down the hill. I went second. As I turned to look at the bridge again, it was five feet in front of me on all fours once again. It stood there as me and my sister skated off. This isn't even the end. I told my sister to head to the main building since there were cameras and lots of light. We skateboarded for what felt like hours. Every minute seemed to last an eternity. As we finally got to the main building, we stopped riding our boards. Out of breath and scared out of our minds, we both looked around for this thing. By this time it was pitch black outside and we could hardly see a few feet in front of us. We made a mad dash at the car, taking a path we have never seen before but it was outside the park which made us feel a little bit safer. After we got to my sister's jeep, we both jumped in, hearts racing and scared out of our minds. When we tried to leave, the gate was locked though, meaning we couldn't leave since there was only one way in and out of the park. We got even more scared. Terrified, but trying to keep our wits about us, we tried everything to get out. We even thought about just leaving the car behind and walking the two hours home but we drove onto the sidewalk and got out of the park eventually. To this day, I won't go back to those wetlands ever again, even in daylight. Whatever that thing was at the river, I never want to see it again. I can't stop thinking about it, and I'm almost 19 now. You can think this is just a story, but I swear it really did happen. Me and my sister don't even talk about it to this day. Something changed between us. I could feel it after that day. This story might not have the most satisfying climax or ending, but it defies all logic and sense and will probably leave you feeling quite bewildered, as it did to me while it was occurring. Having said that, it's still the creepiest series of events that has ever happened to me. When I was a young teenager, my friend Nathan and I would often take my family's large sea kayak out across the nearby river to a small creek that was around half a kilometer away and shot off adjacent to an abandoned golf course. This creek was very slow moving compared to the large Hawkesbury River and because of this, a lot of rubbish and debris would collect at the mouth of the creek before slowly being distributed throughout its length. Nathan and I spent a lot of time at this creek. We even built a small jetty to tie to the kayak to use long sticks with to catch the bailing from the twine that would come from the hay bales that we used to feed the horses back at home. We used this jetty to moor the kayak while we navigated the mess of prickly pear cacti that guarded the borders of the golf course. The golf course itself was incredibly eerie. No animals, birds, or even insects would be heard in that area. Every noise that you made was echoed back at you from a nearby sandstone cliff face. The closest thing that we saw to an animal was the skeleton of a kangaroo, which we found around the second time we went there. It was strange as we had only gone to the spot around a week or so prior, and there was no corpse. Yet, there, in the middle of the clearing, was a full kangaroo skeleton, some bleached and scattered about. We picked up some of the bones and admired them closely, remarking on what part of the skeleton we thought each bone was before tossing them aside. I took the skull back with me in the kayak and placed it on the bookshelf in my room when I got home that afternoon. I often took things back from outings. Nathan never really did, but he was always on the lookout for things for me to collect. The next time that we went out to the creek, we decided to try our luck at exploring the waterways as far down as we could. We armed ourselves with machetes and a small hatchet that we used when we built the jetty and set off. The journey was made extremely difficult by vines that spanned the creek from bank to bank, sunken logs and dense river weed that made paddling near impossible. 
The water was full of garbage, too. Broken tubes, life jackets, boat propellers, you name it, it made its way there. As we made it through to a relatively rubbish-free area that had dark, ominous-looking water, I looked down briefly and saw what I thought was a doll's head just below the surface of the water. I stopped paddling to crane my neck to see it more clearly. It was a doll's head for sure, around a foot below the surface, as if it was tethered from the riverbed. It was looking up with a blank expression and light blue eyes. I instantly got a panicked feeling as I gazed at it. Before I could say anything, Nathan explained, Ah, oh, cool and plunged his hand into the water. I could tell that Nathan was surprised at how deep he had to reach to wrap his fingers around the head, but Nathan was a determined guy. He lifted the head out of the water and looked at me grinning, streams of water running from his closed fist as he held it toward me triumphantly. I took it reluctantly from him. It was a small doll's head around three inches in diameter. The head was clearly sun-damaged, and as a result, it had lost a lot of the paint features. There were no discernible pupils on the eyes, just the blue-colored irises. This gave the thing a disturbing look. I shook my head at Nathan and placed the head on the front of the kayak to look like a figurehead of an old wooden ship. Nathan laughed. Let's call him Bob, he said while grinning. I gave him a deadpan look, trying not to laugh. You're so original, I scoffed at him before turning around to resume paddling. I stopped immediately when I saw Bob staring back at me. I had not placed him like that. I had placed him facing outward. I knew that I had done this because the face creeped me out and I did not want to look at it. Nathan was paddling while I stopped, and so we were moving at a good pace. As I was at the front of the boat... I was meant to keep an eye out for the obstacles and call out if I saw anything ahead. I was entirely focused on Bob, however, as we struck a submerged tree and came to an abrupt stop. Everything on the kayak jumped forward because of this. Nathan, I, our packed lunches, and water bottles. Nothing too major happened. Everything on the kayak had jumped forward, that is, except for the doll's head. I had kept an eye on it the entire time and it did not move even an inch. It was as if it was super glued to the boat. Nathan began teasing me about being blind and I snapped at him to be quiet. He asked what was wrong and I leaned to the right for him to see the head. I pointed and said, It didn't move, dude, while half chuckling. Nathan moved forward to look at it closer. What do you mean? He asked slowly. I picked up the paddle and took a slow stroke backward in the water to lightly hit the tree again. Once again... Everything on the kayak jumped forward slightly as we struck the tree, except for Bob. He stayed perfectly still. Nathan laughed. That's weird, he said, his voice trailing off. I reached out to turn Bob around on his spot, and he turned easily. Let's go home, I said loudly, trying to wash the area of the heavy feeling that was seeming to settle upon us. Nathan agreed, and we turned the kayak around to head home. I watched the head like a hawk. Bob never looked back at me on that trip home, however. When we got home, we packed up everything that we could into our backpacks and lifted the kayak out of the water. The head was stuffed into my pocket. I had not told Nathan about how creeped out I was, out of fear that he would give me crap or give him possible ammunition to play a dumb prank on me with it. Nathan was and still is my best friend, and he would absolutely have done it if he had the chance. I decided to just keep my mouth shut about the stupid doll head and hope that Nathan would simply forget about it. We trudged over to my neighbor's backyard with the kayak, holding it by the handles at both ends. My pocket started to feel very warm. I stopped listening to Nathan's nonsense and began to focus more on the ever-increasing temperature of the head inside of my pocket. Each time I thought it can't get any hotter, it somehow would. It was not burning, more like the feeling of deep heat as it gets left on. I tried my best to ignore it. It was getting dark now, and I really wanted to get home. We dropped the kayak in the garage and put away the machetes and hatchet before making our way upstairs for dinner. I took a detour to my room to dump the head out of my pocket and onto my bed, leaving it there while I left my room to join Nathan and my family for dinner. When Nathan and I finished dinner and entered my bedroom to go to sleep, later that night, the head was absent from my bottom bunk bed. 
Granted, my room was a mess, but it still should have been there, in the cleared spot on my bare mattress. It took a little time for me to look for it, tossing the blankets and sheets aside, climbing on top to peer down through a gap between the bed and the wall. I could not see it anywhere. I was not concerned that I may not see it again. In fact, I was somewhat relieved that it was gone. However, I had a gnawing feeling that it was still around, not watching me exactly, but just a presence. Nathan seemed to have forgotten about it though. He never brought Bob back up again, and that night, he climbed up to the top bunk and promptly fell asleep. I lay down on my bed and pulled the bundle of blankets haphazardly over the top of me, falling asleep rather quickly. The next day, I was awoken by the sounds of thumping noises coming from nearby outside. I got up out of bed and glanced out the window into the front paddock of the property to see my stepfather using the hatchet to hack at a tree stump that was much too large for a minuscule axe. My stepfather was a rather smart man, but his grasp of common sense sometimes bordered on the absurd. I yawned, rubbing my eyes, and turned around before opening them. I froze in place. There on the shelf in front of the kangaroo skull was Bob. His eyes looked once again directly into mine. I turned to look at Nathan, still sleeping on the top bunk and instantly jumped on the railing to punch him hard in the upper arm. He awoke with a pained cry and looked at me with a scowl. What the hell, man? He demanded, lifting his other arm to place his palm over the spot that I had struck with the punch. Like you don't know. I said with a half-assed laugh trying to mask the trembling tone in my voice. Nathan looked incredulously back at me. I stared at him to try to see if his stoic expression would falter. It always would when he played pranks. It did not, though. I shook my head and strapped across the railing so that the bookshelf was in his view. I pointed to the top shelf. You didn't put it there? I asked quietly. Nathan sat up to get a better look and shook his head. Nah, man, I would have had him facing outward anyway. You know, I would have. I spin my head around so fast that I'm surprised I did not break my neck. Sure enough, the head was now facing toward the kangaroo skull and not outward like before. I began shaking. Unable to hold myself up on the railing any longer, I dropped to the floor and stormed over to the bookshelf to pick Bob up and took him out into the kitchen. I stepped on the pedal to open the chrome bin in there and threw him in there a lot harder than I needed to. I did not let the lid naturally close, instead choosing to slam it shut is, you know, a good measure. Honestly, months went by, and Nathan and I never had an opportunity to make our way back to the creek. With school holidays approaching, I was keen to get the big chores out of the way and go spend a day on the river. I did this by working weekends with my stepfather on various projects on our rural property. We used the machetes and hatchet that Nathan and I had taken on our last trip to the creek to complete many of these tasks. We never saw or experienced anything creepy while working next to the creek this time, though. Me and my friend never really had many more adventures up by the creek. We were too scared to go back after that experience, and honestly, I don't want to have to ever go through that again. I don't really know where Bob went, and I don't really care to know. I just know that you should never take anything you find in the river, a creek, or just somewhere you don't belong back home. So back when Pokemon Go came out, I was spending the summer with my mom at the trailer park she lives in in Wyoming. It was a really messy time in my life. Mom and dad hadn't really been divorced all that long, and they were totally at each other's throats over custody and possessions and stuff. Dad had found a girlfriend, which I suppose was good for him. But I was 19 at the time, and I just didn't want to hear anything about it. Anyway, he wanted to go on vacation with his new girlfriend and he had general custody of me, so he and my mom arranged for me to stay with her for two weeks during the summer. I love my mom, uh, I really do, but it sucked being around her when she was so sad. When she was feeling happy, it was just like old times. We were having a girl's vacation basically, but when the thought of the divorce got to her and she'd retreat into her bedroom to cry, it was honestly one of the most emotionally painful times of my life. That's why Pokemon Go became such a welcome distraction, I suppose. It gave me something else to focus on, 
something to take my mind off the whole thing, and that is something I really, really needed. So, one day, I got a notification from the game telling me that if I needed to find water-type Pokemon, that I'd have to find a water source nearby. Some of the water types are so, so cute too, and I really wanted to catch a couple of them to add to my Pokedex. Then, I saw that there was a river nearby, not too far from where the trailer park was. So I told my mom that I was headed out for a walk, along with where she'd be able to find me in an emergency, then headed out to the bright sunshine to catch myself some Pokemon. It was only a short walk towards the river, and honestly, it was such a lovely day for it. I could have spent hours just walking up and down the shoreline, catching all the adorable little water types and giving them cute names. But my peaceful, sunny afternoon was cut short by the sight of something floating in the river. At first, I only saw it through my phone camera as I was catching a polywhirl. Something that looked an awful lot like a clump of garbage floating on the surface of the water. It was under this big highway bridge, so between the bright summer sun and the shade it was in, I couldn't make out exactly what it was initially. I thought it was a real shame that someone would just dump a bunch of clothes in the river or something. As I could tell, a lot of it was made up of cloth. I still remember how slow I was to realize what I was looking at. And God, it makes me remember how dumb I felt. All like, why the hell would someone throw away old clothes? What are they attached to? Until I was actually like, oh no, oh no. Out loud as the super obvious shape of a person could be seen, floating onto the surface of the water. It was just so surreal. Like, it seemed like something straight out of a movie. I wasn't sure if it was real. Or maybe just, I just didn't want it to be real. But as I got closer, the smell hit me. The sickly sweet rotten smell made me gag and wretch and stumble away so I could call 911 without puking. I was in floods of tears by the time the cops showed up. And the officers were very nice to me. Calming me down and asking me just a few questions until a forensics team showed up in their van to check the scene out. Then, a few days later, the local sheriff's department released a statement saying they were pretty sure it was just an accidental death and there was nothing suspicious about it. But it still really messed me up for a while, and I ended up having a few bad dreams about seeing the same floating body in various places. It also really put me off from playing Pokemon Go for a while which was a real shame because it really was such a fun game. Fourteen years ago, my father and I were driving into work early one morning along a rural Wisconsin road that runs along the Trimbell River. While going around a curve to the right, we both saw a woman in a white dress on the opposite shoulder of the road, running towards us with her hands up like she was trying to get our attention. We noticed her just before we passed her, and my dad hit the brakes and spun right around. It was a very curvy road, so we figured she must have gone into the ditch. We were probably a hundred feet from where we were when we saw her, when we turned around. We drove back almost a quarter of a mile when we didn't see her in case she kept running. We couldn't find a car in the ditch or a person on the road. She must have hidden in the ditch. It always seemed weird to me that someone would seemingly flag us down then hide. I don't believe in ghosts, but I looked at many deaths along that road and couldn't find anything in that specific place at all. So within a few months, I forgot all about it. Today, at around 7am, I was driving down that same road and saw a bundle of roses that had been thrown out of a car. A bad Mother's Day for someone. Occasionally, I like to think of myself as an amateur photographer, and I thought it would be a cool noir picture, with everything in black and white except for the petals torn apart on the road. Well, while I was taking some pictures, I realized it was quiet. Too quiet. No birds, no bugs. I couldn't even hear the water in the small river next to the road. All I could hear was the light wind and I don't know how to describe how silence can feel loud, but it was oppressive, almost deafening. Quiet like the woods on a winter night when all the birds are gone and the bugs are dead. Except the sun was shining in mid-May, and it was around 65 degrees Fahrenheit. 
I jumped in my car and sped off. By the time I got around the next curve, I could hear birds and water again. That was when I remembered seeing the lady 14 years ago, and the roses were in the exact same spot as she was running when we passed her. I don't know much about the paranormal. I do not really believe it, myself. I know the roses are just a coincidence, but I cannot explain that silence. It just felt unnatural and bad. I am just sharing this on this show to see if anyone else has ever heard of a phenomenon like this. My brother and I have talked about investigating further, possibly late at night, but neither of us have a clue what we are doing. My university was in a remote location, surrounded by a river. It was almost like an island. Very isolated, and during the weekend, all the locals go home, making it even more eerie. This happened in 2014, when I was around 22 years old. My roommate went home for the weekend, so I decided to sleep in my friend's room. Around 1pm, I woke up feeling thirsty. My friend was studying, so I decided to walk to my room and bring the water bottle as my room was on the other side of the corridor. There was an elevator at the end of the corridor, which played soft music and you would know if the elevator was on your floor. So, I walked towards my room, and as I turned right towards the corridor, I saw an unknown girl staring at the elevator without moving. First, I didn't know who she was, because we can usually tell which year a student is by just being able to see how they act and move around the campus. If somebody was spending three to four years in the same place and looking at the same faces every day, you would definitely notice somebody who doesn't belong. Secondly, the girl was wearing denim pants, sports shoes, and was carrying a backpack as if she had just came back from her class. What's strange is that the hostel door closes at 8pm. The girl was looking straight at the elevator buttons without even blinking. The elevator was still out on her floor, so why wasn't she going in? I could see her side face. It was a very strange stare. I don't know how to explain it. I automatically stopped walking after seeing her and got goosebumps all over my body. Something was stopping me from taking my steps forward. I stood there and watched her for about a minute. After that, I went running to my friend's room and asked her if she recognized the lady. When she came back, she was not there, and the elevator music was still playing. My friend did not believe me, and I still don't know who or what that was. I did some research, though, and noticed that a young girl did go missing who looked very, very familiar. It almost was a spitting image of that girl I saw at the elevator. Apparently, her body was found floating in the river, just outside the campus. So now I'm kind of wondering, are there river spirits roaming the campus still? <laughs> 